gather around. So um, we've heard a lot of very etheric, futuristic things. We saw an amazing art performance. We've been yesterday and today thinking about the future a lot. So I actually just want to take a moment and have you kind of ground yourself in the present moment, if we can do that. So imagine some coil of energy, imagine your feet growing roots, imagine something that places you right here, right now, in the present moment, and ground yourself in it. We're gonna talk about today, and we're gonna talk about something as fundamental as work. So I actually wanna hear from you for a second before we get into things, um, what do you think of when you think of the word work? Shout it out, popcorn it. Passion, Passion nice. Values. Values, this is a good group. Discipline, what else? I heard another one. Stress. Stress. Team. Paying bills, teams. Revenue. Revenue. Fun, nice. What was that one? Leadership. Leadership, yes. So work, work. We hear it all the time, work. Work is tied to labor. How does labor make people feel when we say that? What does labor feel like? Heavy, hard, manual, right? What does the word work employ when we think of it in terms of art? A work of art. Creativity, passion, expression. So the world of work is so fundamental to what we do every day. Our economy is built on our often what has historically been trading our time for dollars in a lot of ways, right? That's what we often have done, trading our time for dollars. Those very fortunate, talented, lucky folks that don't have to trade their time for dollars uh, do provide value in this economic system in some way that exchanges for the dollars necessary to live here. Do we all agree with that? That might change. Just sit with that a little bit. That might change. So I want to go into a few different things around the future of work. And like I said, we're going to ground it in today. So I took out all of the AI stuff and all of the futuristic stuff from the future of work. And I brought Haley Ulray with me, who's our senior operations manager. And I, I, we really want to explain and explore and express sort of what our beautiful MC said yesterday, which is, what do we do today? What do we do tomorrow? And what is the future in the short term going to look like and maybe the long term? So I want to share a few things around what, where our heads are always at with the future of work. So what, what are some work trends that are relevant and current and real? Um, what are some future skills that are going to be in demand? And what are some workflows? This is where we get actionable, maybe a little nerdy, and maybe not that futuristic, because what do we do with off-the-shelf stuff today and tomorrow and the next day to actually change the way that we work? So first, um, the global data sphere is expected to grow from 33 zettabytes. How many of you have heard that term? Like four or five, yeah. Uh, in 2018 to 175 zettabytes by 2025. So I want to make sure you know just what kind of data that we're talking about here, okay? So a zettabyte, we're in the zettabyte era, and I just want you to observe all those zeros. 10 to the 21st bytes is one zettabyte. So then you think about 175 of those in the near future. If one zettabyte was equivalent to a kilometer, that would mean 1,300 round trips to the moon and back, to the terabyte. That, th these are huge, huge numbers. 
And so I just, when we think about AI in terms of world of work and data analysis and the way that we do the things that we do, uh, humans cannot process this data on our own. I'm sorry to say they, you know, the machines are going to do it better, and we're going to need them, because this is, is a crazy amount of information. Where do you think most of this information comes from? What do you think it is? All these data centers keep cropping up. What do you think that this is, all this data? Partially, yeah. Industrial? I was going to say, yes. Much of it's you. Much of it's you. So we are integrated into this equation. And as Ian so wisely says sometimes, um, AI is a mirror. And if we don't like what we see, we need to change ourselves. And then we will see more of what we want. So I think we are in a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift is a time when the usual and accepted way of doing or thinking about something changes completely. I argue we're here, we are here. And I love that beautiful performance because it really showed at the end, everything stopped and there was a sense of, well, what now? The whole world is changing. What are we going to do with that? Everyone feels this to some extent. Some, you know, we, we processed a lot of like savior, villain, co-creator things yesterday, which I thought were really, really cool. And when we look at how we adopt these things, the, this paradigm shift is very important to think about in the way that we work and what we do to create value in this world and take care of ourselves and our families, fundamentally. So some work trends, and I'm gonna breeze through these because I wanna have a room for discussion at the end and we're running, I think, a bit behind. So future of work. Obviously, remote and hybrid work models are becoming more and more standard. Those who can work from home, those companies that can have a workforce who is remote or hybrid are doing so, and it was sparked, of course, by COVID, but vastly, no, this is not going back, right? So what we do, how we work, work-life balance, how we integrate what we do into our life has really fundamentally changed. You know, some of us get more inspired at midnight and do our best work from midnight to 3 a.m. Who's that? I'm just kidding. Some people are more inspired at 5 a.m. and they wake up and they do their best work from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. The traditional model of work did not allow your freedom and your natural cycles to show themselves. So now they do. Now, as long as you're creating value and you're doing good work, it doesn't matter if you're doing it at 3 a.m. for the most part. Virtual collaboration spaces need to come along with that. We're seeing the evolution of this. Uh, digital workforce, how are we going to integrate these robots and automation machines and you know, little, little bots and AI? How are those going to be a part of our teams? How are they treated? How do we interact with them? Are they part of our team meetings? I, I don't know. Um, gamified trainings, these are uh, more and more coming online, but they're you know, here today global talent markets, easily you can employ someone from an entirely different part of the globe. They're working while you're sleeping, vice versa. There's a lot of efficiencies and diversity that comes from this. There's new economic models that are gonna come from this. Diverse work environments, um, to say the least, we're working from a, an RV at the beach or a boat or a co-working space or a big office in the middle of the city, um, depending on where you're happiest and where your employer or yourself need to be. Work-life integration, talked about that a little bit. So aside from technology change, there is something else happening, and I think it's a really important thing that's happening, and it's a generational shift. So for a long time, and these are my friends, this is, I have not named them, but these are my friends. Um, the baby boomers, these are some dates, some general generational uh, parameters around um, when these generations were born and were in their full contribution of work mode. So baby boomers, hardworking individuals, and these are generalizations of, of an entire generation. So you know, I don't like generalizations when I say all, but I'm gonna give you some sort of stereotypes, right? Baby boomers, hardworking, more willing to take risks to pursue their goals, and 
often are very dedicated, very loyal to their, they came from a, a time when you had a 30 year pension and you might retire and you could stay with the same company, you do the same work, you climb the corporate ladder, you paid your dues, you kept your head down, you did good work. I've done this talk a few times and people have said, yeah, this was the last generation before everybody got feelings, right? Everybody got, had felt some kind of way. So baby boomers built all of this in so many ways, the downtown infrastructures, the you know, water systems, sewage systems, their parents built the highway systems. We think about the infrastructure, the government, are all the ways that we do what we do today. Um, that heavy, big, concrete infrastructure was the labor of love and the value of, of the baby boomers. Then you get to Gen X, this is my generation, uh, independent, fiercely independent, people, um, entrepreneurial spirits, they often value more relaxed, flexible environments, and weave innovation and efficiency naturally into most of the things that they do. I would say this is the first PC generation. If I call this, affectionately, the PC generation, because in the 80s, Gen Xers were using IBMs and you know, if and then statements and coding into small little games and had Ataris and things. So there was technology, so it's not to say that there wasn't, um, but the first PC generation. Then you got your millennials. Millennials made a big wave with the boomers, uh, especially like with the establishment, because they came in very wired very differently than their grandparents, right? Um, first generation in, I would call the millennials the first web generation right? First websites, Google search engines, all, all of that. They seek meaningful work usually to grow their creative skills and are wired by purpose. Obviously technolog technologically savvy, but that purpose-driven work was very disruptive to the sort of um, punch-a-clock standards of like industrial manufacturing that we had built the world of work around. So there was this discord. You had heard about it in the news. Everybody was, oh, these millennials don't want to work. That's not true, right? I don't believe that that's true. But there was an ethos if, if, you know, if I do something in three hours and my counterpart takes eight hours to do it, not only should I not get paid less, I should get paid more, right? Because I did it better and I did it faster. But the model of hourly wages and things just created a disconnect and still does to this day and we see why this is changing. Lastly, but not least, our Gen Zs. Uh, my uh, oldest children are in this generation, and this is our, I would say, social media, iPhone, or smartphone generation. Raised with smartphones, understand social media, very globally minded, broad, innovative thinkers, and interestingly that they're the social media generation, this generation tends to prioritize authenticity. <laughs> And I think if, you, if, you're, if you're confused as to something that's like deep fakes or if it's fake news or if it's a picture has filters on it, ask someone under 23 years old. They'll tell you. They know, they know what it looks like, they've been raised with it, they can identify it, they don't get tricked as easily. So this equation, these humans, these generations are in a big, big shift. And if you look at what's happening in the workforce by generation, that gray bar, despite the generational titles, is really the one that I think is really interesting. So we are, our demographics are getting older. Our workforce is aging over time. So if you look at that gray bar, in 2006, 16% um, were over 55. Let's just use that as a marker, over 55 in the workforce. But 2016, it was 22%. And by in two years, it's predicted to be 25% and continues to rise. In the workforce world, we hear about this all the time. Why is this happening? Is it because young people don't want to work? We hear that a lot. Why, you know, young people, they're not wired for work. They don't want to work. They just want to stay home. Yes, there's a larger generations, right? More people. So that's where I'm going with this. Um, demographics on the, in the world are shifting. And I want you to look at this in terms of what it, what it is and look just at how much green and blue there is on this, 
The birth rates that are in green, blue, and purple are countries that are below the replacement rate, which is 2.1. It's considered 2.1 children per female. That's the replacement rate. All of those countries are below. So if you look then again, oh, go back. In that center, you see the red and the black and the yellow, right? That is mostly Africa, I would say mostly African countries, and they are above four and five as a, as a so demographics in the world are shifting. All of those big countries, we're talking about the green and India, Indonesia, Mexico, Vietnam, China, European Union, United States, Brazil, these are the largest countries by population in the world, and they're all below replacement rate. So what does that mean? What does that mean for us, especially in the United States? So this is what the US fertility rate has done in the United States. Over there, you can see, starting around 1920, we had some ups and downs, and then starting in around 1960, 1970, it's mostly steadily trending down. So we are at less than half of the fertility rate that we had in 1920 per woman. So there are, in fact, less people. There are less people. These generations are getting smaller, and the needs have gotten bigger. So what I think is interesting sometimes when we talk about AI is the lens, and what we're here today to talk about, there was a narrative that AI and robotics are going to come in and take everybody's jobs. But there's sort of an interesting, perfect synchronicity happening with fertility rates and automation, and it's all coming together. Um, and if we usher it in kindly and nicely and create the world that we want, maybe we help each other and we co-create with those machines. So I want to talk about future skills for a moment. I will make a big prediction. It's not my prediction. There's a futurist named Gerd. He's a German guy. He's pretty cool if you want to look him up on YouTube. And uh, he boldly said, machines will take every job they can take. I would argue, however, that in this sort of future of work pyramid and skills pyramid, that those jobs will almost totally be in those bottom two um, sectors, the gray and the blue, data and information and intellectual knowledge and logic. Yes, no, yes, no, one, zero, one, zero. They can, you know, you can ask ChatGPT or Copilot or, you know, any of the transformers, you can ask them, hey, read every book of philosophy ever written that you have access to and tell me the major themes and it'll tell you in, you know, 40 seconds. That's pretty cool. That's, I mean, to mine data like that. But does it understand what you're asking, really? Or did you give it a query and it's mining a data set and it's creating comparison statistics and probabilities between the most common themes very quickly, much more quickly. How long would it take a human to read every book of philosophy ever written and come up with those conclusions? More than one lifetime uh, and more, a whole, you know, anyway. So uh, what I think is exciting about the future of work and when we do workforce and we think about humans in this equation is when we get to deeper knowledge, tacit knowledge, which I'll go into in a minute, understanding wisdom and purpose. These are the realms of humans and I think the challenge and what makes us all sort of nervous is the responsibility that with these changes now we must change. And what do we change? How, where do we start? How do we change the way that we work? How do we train people, young people, people that wanna get into this? How do we train them to think and behave differently? So the difference between very quickly explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge is this. Explicit knowledge can be codified. I can study it, I can print a book about it, I could put it on a hard drive and give it to you. Um, explicit knowledge is easily transferable, it's easily um, mineable, you can you know, share it, and it's objective, and it's logical, and it's often anecdotal. So when you go to tacit knowledge, however, Tacit knowledge is human knowledge. Tacit knowledge is often very subjective. It's often earned through experience, through intuition, through a whole bunch of things that maybe don't make any sense correlating together. There's certainly no logical sense 
too, too often what we consider tacit knowledge, yet we have it, right? You can't codify the fact that when you know you're speeding, intuitively you slow down because you feel a police officer and you know you're not supposed to. Those experiences lead us to different behaviors and different types of knowledge that aren't actually linear at all. So how do we build on those? You can't put that experience, you can't put tacit knowledge on a hard drive and share it with somebody. You can't store it, you can't record it. It comes from experience. So it's difficult to transfer. Often we need mentorship as humans. We have face-to-face -face interactions so that we can distribute this type of knowledge. Just want the difference. So human intelligence tends to revolve around emotions, creativity, and I put things on here that really machines are in a very specific realm of data, analytics, probabilities, right? Here we have creativity, empathy, ethics, imagination, consciousness, compassion, mystery, values. We see in gray areas, we ask why. We ask what if. We are the users of this system. What are we going to build? Workflows, and I know we're, we're I'm really gonna run through these, and if we wanna have a deeper conversation, I'm happy to. I'm not an expert in any of these tools. I just think it's important to think about way, the way we work is changing, and what does that mean? We are automating routine tasks. So we, right now today, remember I'm grounding us in today, right now today, I can have an AI on my computer integrated with all of my apps and my mail draft an email for me generate reports for me, I can create, it can create presentations for me. I never use them, but I've tried, I've had them make a bunch of PowerPoints, Copilot will do it, they're not great. So, you know, we're still working in these tools. Also, I think we can enhance collaboration today. So, managing projects, tasks. We used to have a human sit in on every single meeting and take notes. A full-time human sitting in every meeting taking notes. Now we just use Fathom or something, and it mines it, and we say, tell us the action items, and people call it out, right? That is an entire, that has liberated an entire human's reality into doing something much more interesting and creative than sitting and taking notes. So, data analysis, this one's obvious, but creating charts, generating insights, interpreting complex data sets, like I said, reading all the books of philosophy and tell me what the themes are. Content creation, so we, the generative AI, all my images are AI, they're very, they're very fast, they're very cool, they're sort of wild and creative, you can do them quickly, there's not, there's a very unclear level of like intellectual property and how to use these, and so, you know, for now, they're ours to use, and if you just need to get a presentation out the door, you know, these tools are very, very fast, you can write drafts for you, create custom images, Learning and development, so taking tools and tutorials, learning new features and skills. How can we help this train us? And then, obviously, the, the personalized assistance, right? I can't wait to get one up and running. Tell me where I have to go. Where do I need to be? Tell me about my, my time usage, my schedule. How do I analyze? Like, how am I doing repetitive tasks? Help analyze this for me and tell me where I can leave those on the table. So, multilingual support. Immediate translation, this will be a game changer if we want to work in global economies, to be honest. We need to, to be able to speak to each other. And we heard some really cool things yesterday about speaking to nature and speaking to whales, maybe. Speak, what, what does the rest of the world think is going on? I want to know. So the impact on work. So th these tools right now can save, on average, depending on what it is, 30 to 50% of your time. Think about that. If, you, if, you, if someone gave you 40% more time right now, what would you do with it? So many things. Nature abhors a vacuum, right? So, oh my gosh, what could I do? And that is what we can use these tools for today and tomorrow and the next day. Employees that are using generative AI are already saving almost two hours a day in what they were previously doing that was manual, data entry, Excel, entering numbers into spreadsheets, things like that. Okay, lastly, 
these are, these are my wishes. This is my wish list for things that we will do together. Um, let's talk openly about this technology disruption and just acknowledge the joy and the fear and the, all the things, because it's happening, we can't go back. Become digitally literate, and that really means everyone. Digitally literate, in whatever way that means to you. Try things, experiment, there's a ton of tools. Put yourself out there and learn a few of them. Whichever one's thing most interesting, whatever you're drawn to, play with them. Um, harden the soft skills conversation because the top of that pyramid, my prediction, the top of that pyramid is, is what all demand for future human jobs will be. Yeah. Um, pilot something, start somewhere. Something easy, like Haley's about to go into some things that we piloted and they don't seem big and sexy. We're not gonna have a startup for them, but they have transformed the way that we do what we do and we know they will transform for others. So start digitizing, get easy wins, um, nurture an innovative work culture. That If you run a business or oversee a business or an organization or something, let people try stuff and fail and don't just let them encourage the spirit of trying, because failures are just iterations, right? You ask any entrepreneur or anyone who's in like venture capital or anything, you want to fail and you want to fail fast and you want to fail again and again so that you don't have to fail anymore, so that you find the win. Find the wins, try them, fail fast. Um, challenge the status quo, this one's hard. I mean, it's not hard for everyone, but it's, it's challenging to also get consensus and bring people along with you while challenging the status quo that they feel safe in. Challenge it anyway, and do it with love and kindness, but do it anyway, because it needs to be done. Um, fail forward, adapt, become a futurist, pay closer attention, find a podcast, a blog, an article, anything, and just kind of pay attention wherever it is in your sphere that these technologies are happening. And then finally get um, comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because gonna transitions are like this. It won't be this way forever, but we are in a paradigm shift. Again, a time when the usual and accepted way of doing or thinking about something changes completely. My last word of advice before I hand it over to Haley is actually gonna talk about the how and how to do these things, which is so cool. Um, do something today that your future self will thank you for. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Haley. Okay, I will be around, we're gonna switch seats. Is that a thing? Good morning, everybody. Um, happy Saturday. Um, when Heather asked me to join her on this, I thought, you know, public speaking is my favorite thing to do, and this is the favorite morning. Like, I would, I would yeah, I would definitely choose a Saturday morning, so, of course, I am in. <laughs> I'm glad everyone is catching the sarcasm there, so I'm just leading with that. Um, okay, so, like Heather mentioned, we are trying to ground in work that's actually being done things that are available to everybody right now. Um, and I, I want to say this isn't the conversation around how to code and build things from scratch. We're not talking to, well, we are talking to developers. But if you're not a developer, that's fine. If you don't come with that technical background, what is available to you right now that you can grab off the shelf and plug into your operations? That's what we're talking about. And that's what we've done at Rogue Workforce Partnership. So we're going to go over some of those examples and see our, some of our big wins. Um, any Smartsheet users in the room? A little bit? A few? Cool. OK, so Smartsheet is my favorite app. If you, I mean, you could ask anybody, any of my colleagues, they would tell you. This is like my go-to. I probably overuse it. I've been told that I overuse it. So it is a problem. And I acknowledge it, and we're working on that. <laughs> we are branching out, diversifying. Um, but within Smartsheet, there are a lot of awesome built-in tools. We've got the real-time collaboration, project management. We have data visualizations built into it. And this is all built with AI on the back end. They've got AI tools where we can summarize our information, analyze our data, and even build out metrics that we need to see. 
Um, two specific projects that we've worked on because I want to ground us in the work that RWP is doing because it's so awesome and this isn't just me. I've got a team but a very small team and that's another good point. We, we are a team of 10 and we're doing really cool work and we're using tools that are already out there because we don't have the bandwidth to build by scratch. Um, so the first one on the bottom right is our operational contract management. When I started with RWP four years ago, and Bex, plug your ears, um, <laughs> we were so far out of compliance when it came to our federal and state reporting, below 50% on time percentage. I told you, don't listen. <laughs> the ones working on EPA, don't listen. Um, we implemented this tool to bring in that collaboration and hold accountability to team members and identify, have the conversations around who's doing what and where do we need support. And I wanna highlight, you can see it maybe a little bit, it looks a little fuzzy, but we are at 100% and we've held that for over a year now, which is a huge accomplishment. And it's by, thank you, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to be in compliance, like that, yeah. It's a, it's a good goal to have. Um, so this has been instrumental to our team. We meet on a regular basis and we pull up this dashboard and we're all talking about it. We're interacting within the platform and we are killing it. Um, the next one on the top right is just a quick glance at our fis fiscal management system that we use with our service providers and various partners. Um, again, starting with RWP, don't listen. Um, we had so many fiscal errors going and ending program years, and I'm talking about months and at least five employees trying to reframe things and fix things so that we can be successful. Um, we implemented this tool that brings transparency across all of our budgets with every single provider we work with. Um, we can project and see what's coming up, even dollars that haven't been spent yet. We can see where we're at <laughs> down to every line item. And I'm, and I'm talking about working with multiple partners on this and pulling it all into one space where we all can see what's happening. And we are down, we don't have any fiscal errors. Not one. Bex, not, not one. No. <laughs> we don't have any fiscal errors wow. to this degree at the end of the program here. <laughs> not one. And I know that might sound crazy, but we are a little nonprofit that has worked in its own, own way, and if you work with a nonprofit, you might understand a little bit how it's kind of not traditional. And I come from private sector, so when I walked in, I'm like, what the hell is happening? So, <laughs> <laughs> but the, there are tools out there that can help and get these things in order. Um, our next one, Power BI. Any Power BI users out here? Ooh, awesome, okay. I, well, that was really enthusiastic. I actually like Smartsheet better. But Power BI is an awesome tool, and we just recently have pulled that system in, and we've got a really cool project looking at our performance management. Um, because I don't know if anyone else has this issue, but it might be another nonprofit thing, but our data, working with the state and federal agencies, is really hard to get to. We, they do not allow APIs. They don't allow these cool, innovative things to grab data and be able to manipulate it and see it how you need. So we've built systems around that. We've had to constantly do workarounds to get the things that we need. Um, and I'll go into how, we, how we're getting that data next. Um, but we are there. We're able to get data that was once not unreachable, unreachable, but we had a staff member that was working three days a month pulling, exporting, manipulating, and building charts so that we could see where we're at prior, so we were always behind, and we never had real-time data until this. Um, so with this tool, we have the data visualizations. We can see live data coming through, so our program team can make data-driven decisions. Um, and it's all looking at our performance management. And the nice thing about Power BI is we can use that Q&A feature, which is the nice AI feature that allows people to speak in a natural language to it and it will analyze the data for you. So how did we make that happen? With our scrappy team. Another awesome tool that's out there, if you're not aware, UiPath has been like our secret weapon. Does anyone use UiPath? You do? Cool. 
Um, so this was the way that we were able to grab that data from these different sources, and I'm, we have multiple sources of data. Um, it uses a bot, so we've created a bot and trained it how to go retrieve the data, where to put it, and then connect that to our Power BI, which allows us to have that real-time data. Um, it updates daily, which is something that we have historically never had. Um, so it uses the AI and machine learning in order to do that. Um, you build out the workflow similar to like a Power Automate and other systems. And it just simulates that human interaction with digital, sim with digital systems. So again, that's been our little secret weapon. We have it connected to Smartsheet and Power BI. It runs out and grabs everything that we need. We can leave it alone and it's doing the work for us. So again, taking away the hours that are traditionally spent on exporting, manipulating, doing all of that, we're wrapping it all into one so that this, pro this whole process is automated. Other AI tools that we love, so this is about all the cool stuff that we've been, on, we've been doing because Heather's got an awesome mission, and we've got a small team and we gotta be scrappy. We all know ChatGBT. I think I've heard it a thousand times, so I think we all share the love for that. We're, we're using it daily, definitely. Um, Copilot is also really nice, integrated in your Microsoft system, so you can use it across the various apps in there. Designer, if you haven't heard of this and you're writing any kind of newsletters, textbooks, um, any ebooks, whatever it might be, Designer is a game changer. It will do your branding for you. It has AI built into it, so if you want to change the tone of your writing, if you want to, whatever you want to do, I would definitely jump on that one and play there. And then Grammarly, just to ensure that we are being consistent with our, our writing. Um, so let's talk about results. What has all this work done for RWP? Um, I mentioned the reduction in manual data tasks. Um, but I was able to do a little bit of digging and some, some math around this, and we are right now saving approximately $41,000 by these projects that we've done annually, which might not sound like a whole lot, but I wanna say again, we're a small nonprofit. I've done big projects in manufacturing, and so I know that it, it might not be like something huge, but that is, that's game changing for us. And that's just our phase one implementation. We're looking at more than doubling that with phase two. We are also compliant. That is huge. Our compliance with state and federal reporting has gone from 31% to 100%. And we've stuck with that for over a year now. Our budget transparency, we touched on this too. We have a reduction in fiscal errors by 100%, 100%. That's, that's game changing. That, and if I, I could go back and do the math on that, on how much time we're saving for all those employees that routinely, at the end of every program year, had to go fix things, what, how much we're saving not having to do that, and the ability of that they can, they can focus on other things, real things. We can drive forward instead of always being stuck in this reactive state. We have done so much work to get out of this reactive state and it's really showing. And then that last piece, I don't have a statistic or anything to tie to it, but we have real-time performance data, that's huge. And that's something that a workforce board typically doesn't have because of all the data barriers that you have. Um, but we've been able to be scrappy and innovative and use AI and use these tools that are already out there in order to make it.